student learning outcome discussion has, has really originated because we really ultimately don't know what it is that's happening to our students in education. So uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge really the, the work of all the faculty coordinators and student learning outcomes coordinators and people who are supporting uh, student learning on campuses. As, as we go through the presentation today, uh, I'm, I'm sure you, you, you know it already, but there are really a number of things that are kind of like stacked up against us, against those people who, who would like to talk and, and, and pursue and uh, indulge in the discussion about student learning. So, so there we are. So I, I certainly would like to uh, make sure that your role is recognized and, and I'm, I'm just forever grateful for all the emails and, and, and uh, exchanges that we've been having for the, in, in the last year or so. Um, so there, there it is. Uh, there is the acknowledgement uh, from, from, from John Dewey that, that, that uh, thought came, uh, what, about over 100 years ago now. If we teach today's students as we taught yesterday, we rob them of tomorrow. So that's that's probably like a guiding principle of, of what it is that we think we are going to be, what I think we are going to be talking about and what, what student learning outcomes actually address. Uh, so that's that's for us to ponder. And, and again, I, uh, the title of today's talk is, is has professional development in it. And the reason for that is, is um, 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 again, I'm on the on the quest to provide support. So it's just one of those little things that I, I tell you, whenever you get bogged down and, and, and you're depressed and there's just too many things coming at you, uh, look up John Dewey's quotes on education. You will always find something that's going to lift you up. So here we go. So why are we talking about student learning outcomes? So a um, few, few years back, and again, this is this is there's there's literature there about uh, what's what's what, what's been happening, but you most of you have heard of this spellings report uh, that the, um, that was like late late 90s you know when when um, President Bush signed uh, no child left behind and and to a uh, really waves of, of criticism and whatnot uh, yet the, the the idea that that uh, the, the ideas that this 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 document started are kind of like lingering on because the questions started being asked of educators, in higher ed, what it is that our students know? What is it that they do? Um, you, you can just, just, just walk around and ask your faculty. And, and again, uh, grading is one aspect of the, of the discussion. And we'll, we'll talk about this in, in, in greater detail in just a minute. But the bottom line is that stu our students graduate from, from, from our institutions, they go and look for work. And what happens is that our employers are really not asking students what is their GPA, what classes that they've taken, but the, but the discussion switches to the competency attainment. The, competent, the, the employers ask what it is that you can do. And as a matter of fact, when you, when you look at the student resume, same thing, unless you are graduating with honors and all your, 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 your GPA is, is 4.0 or higher, you normally don't disclose the GPA on the resume, right? It's not something that you necessarily discuss. The question is what it is that you can do. So um, the result of, 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 of this uh, lack of paying attention to what it is that our students are learning is that uh, for the most part, because we are so focused on grades, because we are so focused on, on uh, accountability as understood by transfer rates and, and degree attainment, Learning is, is implied. So it, 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 if, if, if you think of students who are leaving your courses with A's and A pluses and whatnot, with, with high degrees, high, high recognition um, remarks and, 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 and perhaps uh, any, 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 any type of, 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 of acknowledgement of their high academic achievement, they, they must be learning something, right? But then when you, when you ask yourself, you really, you really don't know. And then what happens is that uh, I, I think that the best attestation to this statement would be what it is that happens with the students once they leave our classrooms. So just you, you're, you're, you're probably, you, you, you may have heard, and again, this is uh, some of the books that are documenting this, that when students leave our classrooms and they move on to a higher level, uh, something qualifies them to go to that higher level, right? And that's going to be a GPA or course completion. So that means that when students complete a course, they are ready to go somewhere else. And in that somewhere else, 
you know, it's, it's either ours or someone else's classroom. And the first thing that we do is, okay, the, the conversation with the counselor has taken place. So student is qualified to enter the class. Then the uh, GPA obviously qualifies that student to, student to be here. And the conversation, however, switches right away into a skill. Right away, we start asking questions. Okay, so you're in this English 101 class and, and okay, so uh, do you know APA or, 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 or do you know that uh, certain chemical formulas or, or do, you, do, you, do you understand or what, 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 what would you do if you were to, given, to be given this, this, this uh, uh, mathematical equation? So, so that's where students all of a sudden get, get in trouble. And I'll show you um, a, a short video later on about the mastery, mastery learning. But one of the resources that I, that I would like to pro provide to you is I Love Learning, I Hate School. That's, that's a uh, book written by um, Susan Bloom, uh, who was the, uh, one of the speakers, one of the presenters at our SLO symposium uh, three weeks ago. And I think that the, the, the title of that, of that um, Mm -hmm. of that book is very telling. I love learning, I hate school. That's what we all do. And, and when you think about it, many of us, we, we, we are here for a reason, right? Because we, we, we've gone through so many years of schooling and, and we figured out the system, we really have. Yet we persisted to, to those degrees after 10, 12, 14, 16, 20 years of, 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 of sitting in classrooms we think that we ultimately have something to say, we have something to share. And that's why, that's why we end in the, in the, in the business, uh, I suppose. So that what, what really, um, uh, going back to, 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 to what stirred up the discussion was the publication, one of the, one of the reasons why we we're talking about student learning outcomes and what it is that students can do, was the Academically Adrift uh, book published in 2011. And, and again, it stirred up a lot of controversy and we are still talking about it. But the bottom line is that the authors of the book claim that our students just simply don't learn enough or we really don't know what it is that they learn uh, for all those reasons that I mentioned earlier. And here is the, where, where the um, uh, question, uh, articulation of higher order skills or skills and competences is what, what, uh, what, what shows up, what appears. So all of a sudden, instead of SLOs, which really nobody knows what they mean, uh, we start talking about skills. And let me just go back for a second to the term SLO. I, I, I am still, you know, I've been, I've been studying literature on student learning outcomes assessment for, let's just say 10 years, I, I think. It's probably a little bit longer than that. But, but I've been really reading quite actively and, and, and you know, uh, I, I, there, there's, there's, there's quite a bit of research that I've done on the topic. I still don't know where the SLO comes from. Why, why would we all of a sudden call competencies and skills, student learning outcomes. Um, as a matter of fact, there are a couple of publications that are still being used, and I, I will refer to those later as well. There is uh, the Academic Senate, the State Academic Senate for California Community Colleges published uh, Guiding Principles for SLO Assessment, and then there is um, SLO Glossary. And it's a funny thing that in the, in the SLO Glossary there, when you look up the word competency, you know, it refers you to an SLO. And then SLO is this, this huge, very, very elaborate, detailed uh, definition of, of, of uh, what, it, what it really means. Uh, the, the problem here is that when we, when we speak of SLOs, uh, again, first of all, there is this issue of, you know, SLOs is something that is being imposed on faculty, that, you know, faculty are doing their work as they are supposed to, they are grading, they are teaching, they are holding office hours. And all of a sudden, they are supposed to be doing SLOs. So that's that's uh, yet yet a different discussion. That that perhaps I I, I don't know. I mean, I, I I will explain this, you know, in, in greater detail in just a minute. It's just that the point of it is is that uh, instead of SLOs, if we only use the word competency or skill or something that you know public in general can relate to, then it would just be so much easier for us. I think. Uh, there, there is this anecdote that I heard a few years back that, that you know, if you, if you go to a, across the street from Santana College, there's a Target store and, and, and just kind of like, you know, start, got, got, got me thinking at some point. If I were to go to a, a HR manager at Target and say, okay, I, I work at Santana College and our students will bring certain SLOs to you 
what SLOs do you think they need to find a job here? Okay, what 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 do you think? What what kind of an answer I'm going to get? You know, what what, what are you talking about? Is, is is SLO is you know what, what in the world is this? But if I were to go and ask the same thing in terms of competency and skill, then I'm sure every HR manager anywhere out there would probably tell you tell me, yeah, your students need to communicate. Your students need to know technology. They need to be team players. And these are very specific competencies that students should be gaining as a result of. Uh, going through educational experience at our, at our institutions. So uh, skills and competencies and SLOs. And again, John Dewey co comes to mind. Give the people something to do, not something to learn. And the doing of is of such a nature as to dem demand thinking. Learning naturally results. And that's, uh, that, I think, puts the whole conversation about student learning outcomes in a very, very deep and at the same time, very, very clear, very succinctly stated concept. Okay, let's not, let's not have perhaps even necessarily discussions about accountability and everything that kind of like, you know, moves us away from what it is that we need to be doing for our students. But instead, let's focus on what it is that they learn. And look, all we really need to do is, is just kind of like, you know what, maybe, maybe even Okay, I don't want to say stop lecturing, but but I, you know what? Stop stop nagging. Just just kind of like you know, create an environment where students can learn, and let's let's go ahead and have a discussion around that concept rather than you know, oh, there is just so many things I have to cover. I think that's that's one of the reasons why we are having these discussions because covering of the curriculum, covering of the material, is just no guarantee that students will learn anything. So the focus really needs to be on what it is that students can do, and we can we can actually observe that doing. So thank you again. I I, I apologize. I, I I cannot. I I don't have any any way to to talk, manage the slides, and, and look at the uh, look at the uh, chat. So so please don't hesitate. It, it is meant to be a discussion. So if you feel like you would like to say something, don't don't hesitate to to, to raise your hand. And now the SLOs came from WASC, WASC you know, okay, so, so um, I don't know if SLO statements came from WASC, the demand for SLOs came from WASC, right? So the same thing is with, with uh, ACCGC, which is the accrediting body for community colleges in California, that uh, we, are, we are expected to develop those student learning outcomes statements. And we'll get to this in just a minute, literally in just a minute, what we, where, where they come from and, and where we are going. So what, what, about, uh, what about the skill? What about the, the competency? So uh, again, doing research, connecting with many of you and speaking with pretty much anyone I could think of in, 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 uh, or, or whoever I, I was able to get a hold of. Uh, it seems to me very clear. And again, maybe at this, this conversation, again, it's a conversation. So I'm, 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 I'm really uh, hoping that, that if you have uh, anything that's meaningful to say about this, I, I would certainly appreciate your thoughts. Uh, because as, 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 as we all talk about these things and, and, and we try to relate to them, uh, we grow professionally. And, and, and obviously, I'm not, not an exception. I really, I really like to grow. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative of the thoughts and, and the thinking that I, that I hear as, as, as time goes by and I interact with many of you. But the bottom line is that the skills and competencies is what, is what we teach, right? So, so uh, what, what we do in the classroom, ultimately, we would like to make sure that our students learn something as a result of the, of the interaction with us. Uh, Roya, please go ahead. I, I, you raise your hand. I, I apologize <laughs> for time. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, everybody. My uh, question, actually, I, or maybe we can discuss about it, is this one that how we can have a balance between uh, working with the students uh, prefers and uh, make sure they learn something. Because one problem that I have, I, I started to don't uh, put any grade for the assignments. But the result that I got was that when a lot of students didn't do that assignment. I wanted to give them the situation that they feel they like to do it, not they have to do it but it didn't work. So at the same time that I 
agree 100% that we need to provide a, an environment that students like to uh, learn instead of they have to learn or get the grade. At the same time, we need to have some knowledgeable students to be able to compete in this global world. Our students cannot be illiterate compared to other students in the world. So I have a question how we can make a balance. Right. So, so I think that the concept that you mentioned is, is you, if, at, at the end of the course, we have to issue the grade, right? But as a matter of fact, I will be talking about grading in, 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 in a few minutes. I, I do have a number of slides, but just, just the same author who wrote the book, I Love Learning, I Hate School, wrote a book named Ungrading, and I'm going to refer to it later. It's a just fascinating publication. Grades as we know it is, is really not the best system to assess what it is that students learn. We, it's, it's a proxy for learning. So, so we, we assign a letter and therefore there is, there is some data that we, uh, that we have. And as a result, we can say, okay, these are our, this is how much our students learn. And again, there's, there's just, it's, it's a very, very problematic concept. Uh, and and, and we, we, we operate within a number of constraints. So, so your, your point is absolutely well, well taken. And again, as we go along, I'll, I'll make sure that we address it. So uh, hopefully you are going to have your questions answered as well. And there is uh, Leanne, I'm sorry, would you please? No, yeah, I think I just wanted to add to the conversation of why this is so timely because as I'm pitching, I'm, I'm, this is my first year as SLO coordinator at Cerritos College. I'm very happy that a lot of faculty are asking me why, not just why do we have to, but why would we want to? And my background is in language learning also. I see a few similar. And one of the ways that I explain it is that I know a lot of people who took four years of a language in high school who even got A's and B's, but who don't know how to actually use that language. Um, and so that's kind of the example that I give is that we want to make sure that what we're grading is actually meaningful um skill and competency so I, I just wanted to say that i think this this idea of why is really important uh, absolutely thank you very much for that comment yes yes that's that's very true again it's it's uh, ultimately what what really determines student success is what it is that they can do right and 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 again if if, if we teach it then we can observe it and then ultimately if we can teach it if we can observe it we can certainly assess it and, and I, I think that there is the whole realm of this discussion that, you know, many, many, uh, let's just say there is organizations and, 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 and research paper that I, papers that I read that faculty are supposedly resentful to assessment. And I'm, I'm just not sure if, if, if it's because I don't understand what assessment means or, 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 or where is this discussion? Because when you, when you think about it, um, Faculty, when, when we come in to, to the classrooms, and I can safely say we, I mean, I, I have observed other teachers in, in, in my life in their classrooms. Uh, we go back and forth. I mean, the first minute we, we the, 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 the minute we, we, we open the classroom door, we start asking questions. How is everybody doing? Did, do you have any questions about homework? Do you understand what we talked about? If, if I were to ask you that question, how would you answer this? I mean, those are just endless, endless, endless probes and attempts to really elicit student understanding and the depths of their knowledge on the given topic. So again, if, if faculty are resentful to assessment, then, then I, just, I just don't, I, I, I completely am missing this, this argument. I, I, now, something could be said about the alignment of that assessment, again, when it comes to grading versus assessment of skill, but that's a different discussion. So again, it's not that faculty are, are, are resentful to assessment. As a matter of fact, when I think about it, you know, I was, I was a little boy. I'm, I'm, I'm sure my mom taught me how to tie my shoes and then she checked if I could do it before I went to school, right? And, and I'm, I'm sure that many of us experienced that. And I just wonder if there was a case in, 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 in hum, history of the humanity, if anyone has ever tried to teach someone anything, why would they do it without checking for understanding? So that's, that's, that's just my point of it. Okay, Madeline, please go ahead. Good morning. Hi. So you, that was partly, um, I was going to make that point that faculty don't resent assessment, they resent admin explaining. You know, assessment is what teaching is. And then suddenly someone comes along and says, you know, it would be great if we, <laughs> if we assess student learning. So that's quite annoying. Um, right. But the other thing I wanted to say, and I know this is a bit of a downer, is 
you were talking about like the wider context, where did all this come from and academically adrift and so on. To be honest, I think there is even a bigger context and it's good for us to keep in mind that even with all the frenzy of college and the primacy of education, and if you don't go to college, you know, that's the end of the world. The fact is what I hear in that is a frenzy of justification. I think this culture is losing a consensus around the value of anything other than vocational training. And because the other than vocational training is what shaped our curriculum, it's harder and harder to justify what we're doing. I thought Roxham's, I thought the Aram and Roxham book, sorry, I hope they're not on this call, but apart from being written so badly that I've used lots of its sentences in my classes, but also I thought it was kind of ill-conceived. Who the hell knows what you take away from your classes in terms of critical thinking after two years? It's like I planted a pea vine in November and by November 12th, nothing had happened, but now I have a lot of peas, you know? So it's a kind of, it's, a, it's really a call for schools and colleges to justify themselves with tangible results. And the truth is, in a lot of ways, on the terms that we're being asked to do, we won't be able to. So I think one of the things we can do with this mandate is try to think of what can people, how can we use this um, mandate to show people that we're doing something worthwhile in terms that do make sense for us as and this is especially general ed educators. Right, right. Madeline, did, I hope you could hear me, by the way. Yes, I'm yes, I can. Okay, we are, we are fine. You're kind of breaking up, but I think we got the gist of it. You know, uh, Madeline, thank you very much for these comments. I, I, I tell you, I couldn't agree more. And as a matter of fact, I, 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 I had a conversation uh, just uh, just few gosh, just 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 really few days ago, and it just hit me as 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 you know, almost like a ton of bricks, you know. It's not that our students are not learning, they are. See, it's just that our system relies on grades so much that the only thing that students talk about is the grade. And if the grade is too low, what can you do to improve it? So we really don't have a good language. We don't have theory. We don't have uh, anything to, to latch onto if we were to empower, in order for us to empower our students to talk about what it is that they learn on what it is that they can do. We just don't do those things. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, if, when, I, when I asked the coordinators, one of the research projects that I did, I asked them, you know, hey, what, what is it, what, what's the difference between grading and SLO assessment? And you know what, I, what I, one of the coordinators said, very, very, you know, spot on comment, students care about grades. And that's very true. We just, as, 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 as a system, as faculty, there is, there is nothing else that we care about. And the reason for that is probably, like I said earlier, we've gone through educational systems for many, 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 many years. And for so many years, just like that little boy in the movie that we, show, that, that we watched at the beginning, what have we been told? Hey, this is a textbook, chapter seven, next week on Thursday at 6 p.m., there is going to be a test, please come prepare. How is that really lending itself to a discussion about what it is that I'm learning? It's more about accountability, showing up on time, making sure that I read the textbook. Those are different requirements than, you know, why don't you explain to me, evaluate the phenomena, give me the reasons, why don't you assess all those things that have to do with um, student learning outcomes and competencies. Leanne, please, I think you used to have your hand up. Oh, sorry. No, I'll take it down. Oh, okay. Okay. No, not a problem. Not a problem then. So again, uh, going back to our slide here, if, if um, the point of it is that, that if, if, if there is certain, uh, por uh, a certain part of knowledge that, that, that we need to cover or we need to disclose to students, if we were to only look at sort of from a different perspective and, and say, okay, as a result of this teaching, students will be able to do something, then the question is going to be all of a sudden, okay, if I am not teaching skills and competencies, then what am I teaching? I mean, please tell me if this is, if this is you know, something that, that's, that's, that's misunderstood. Uh, because again, uh, if, 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 if my job as a, as, a, as a professor, as faculty, is to make sure that students learn, why wouldn't I, I be interested in finding out how well they have acquired the given skill? 
The same thing is with assessment. And we just talked about, right, this dismissal alignment. But when you think about it, if, if, if we are not assessing the success of, of, our, of our activities, the success of our teaching, teaching strategies, then what are we assessing? And, and there was, you know, and, and again, an anecdote, and let's just say this was a department a few years back I, I, I worked with, and, and, and they, they were swearing by a multiple choice test that they were giving to students at the end of the semester. Oh yeah, it covers all the SLOs. There is, we don't have to talk about anything. They are all covered. Okay, so the, the department shows me they has three, four, five SLOs. And then there is one test that they give at the end of the semester and I challenged them and they actually did. They, they aligned all SLO statements to the multiple choice test. And out of the 62 or 78 or however many items they had, on the, uh, on the test, at the end of the alignment, you know, they went for SLO one is addressed in question number one, question number seven, question number 15, 28, and so forth. And so SLO number two, blah, blah, blah. So they did the whole analysis, took them about half an hour, but they figured it out. And then at the end of the conversation, they had 60, let's just say 67 points on the, on the multiple choice test, and they were left with seven. So none of the SLOs was, was addressing those seven, seven uh, items on the test. So then the question was, okay, so, so are you assessing something you're, you're not teaching or you're teaching something that you're not assessing? And we had the conversation about this and then all of a sudden it just kind of like, you know, opened up for them. That it's really the question is of that, of the, of the content. So the question, uh, oh, and I made myself a, a, a point here, AB705 is what, what's really very often uh, brought up in this context, because as, as we know, it has far reaching implications. And for those of you who don't know, the AB705 is a, uh, law that, that requires that our students um, who, who normally would have been placed in, in never ending cycles of, of re remedial education uh, can promote themselves and move themselves to, the, to, 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 to higher levels. Uh, and uh, and this, is, this, is, this is all good. It's just that you know, now uh, faculty in, in, in English and math, probably the largest departments at any college are throwing their hands up in the air saying, okay, Look, what, look what's going on. These students are not ready and they are coming to our class because by law, they have to be here. But see, the, the, the point of this is, is that we, if we only, and this is, you know, again, from, from, from reading and writing on the topics and talking to a lot of people, I just quickly realized that if we only paid attention to the skill and competency, to be honest, we wouldn't have any need for AB705 because AB705 is based on course completion. It has nothing to do with student life, okay? So now the, the next question, oh, and there is one, one anecdote from history that I kind of like, I, I would like to share with you. Uh, over hundred years ago, there was this Winnetka school district in, in uh, Illinois, close to Chicago. And they developed this, this competency-based school that was really based on attainment of mastery before students were able to go anywhere. So in the common essential section of grade work, a pupil could move as soon as the material had been mastered. See, right now, we don't have an option like that at all for our students, right? In higher ed, as a matter of fact, we take pride. If you are missing something, there is a course for that. And if you don't understand this, oh yeah, we have a course. And then there is another course. So what happens is that students come in and, and they end up taking all those courses, which is you know one of the contentious or, or, or points that, that Guided Pathways is pointing out, right, as, as, as we heard, that students are taking endlessly courses that, that, that for, for no good reason, that they, you know, we really need to squeeze the system out so that they, they go through the system faster. But, but, but ultimately, I believe that's, that's the main reason for this, because we don't have any other way for them to, 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 to do anything else in terms of, 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 of their educational progress or, or learning. We only can offer them courses. There is just 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 nothing else that exists in the system. So um, on one end, we are very very critical of it, and we would like to squeeze it. But on the other, there is just no remedy. There there isn't any. Well, we'll, we'll talk about what it is that we think we could do in the future. But currently, that's that's the system. So then, the second section in the Winnetka plan of students had no achievement standards. Each pupil did as much or as little as they wished. I mean, imagine that, you know, this is, this is like, you know, the, the schools in Finland and Japan, that's, that's, that's what they are basing their, you know, um, that's, 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 that's the focus of their uh, instruction activities in their schools. And just, just imagine that, that we 
uh, bring it here, you can you can you can just imagine. And again, you you could probably look up there. There is I don't know some videos on on YouTube that I think I've seen about standardized testing. And even right now, we we just heard from President Biden that because of COVID, oh yeah, we got to go back to 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 standardized testing uh, as soon as we can. Well, okay, that's that's what we do. Let's just say that there is there is there is there is other options, and 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 maybe that's why it's so difficult for us again as SLO coordinators, as people who are concerned with student learning. That's so difficult for us to 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 push back on 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 all those um, calls for accountability because again we simply don't don't have the structure, we don't have the language, we really don't. If we don't assess student learning, then we have nothing to talk about. So uh, where do SLOs come from? Uh, where do SLOs and competencies come from? So uh, for uh, our system, community colleges, and there is uh, our state universities and UC system, um, we do have um, the course, course ID, course descriptors. And as a matter of fact, maybe, maybe what I could do is um, uh, share this with you. So, I will go ahead and start start with English, and this is this is uh, the the um, idea behind the database is to find the, the 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 courses that will articulate from community colleges to to uh, state universities and uh, University of California system. So um, is again the system is based on course completion. Again, there's there's nothing nothing here that will tell you about what it is that students learn. We are only concerned with with uh, with course completion. So let's look at um, let's look at English, uh, and then look at let's look at uh, college composition, and there it is. So this is this is the descriptor. This is sort of the the source of all the information about the course in community college system, right? And, and there are there are people in the audience who who know much more than I do about about how the system works. So if if you feel like I'm not saying something that's correct, don't don't hesitate to raise your hand and speak to it. Uh, but this is this is where the the descriptor is. And um, out of all the things that we have here, so there is the 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 number of units that students are are, are awarded, and then the, there is the general description. There is part with objectives right here. And when we unfortunately have a conversation about student learning outcomes, then right away uh, there are voices. Oh no 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 no! These are these are objectives. These are not outcomes. So again, this is one of those uh, again very very uh, sharp and 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 always spot on arguments that that put uh, SLO coordinators in the back of the room, so to speak, because. We already sound like we don't know what we are talking about because this is obviously an objective and we are talking about outcomes, right? Or our definition of, and, and we go into this endless discussion about what's the difference between objective and an outcome. So the bottom line is that we, that the course outline of record tells you what the course content is. And if those objectives are outcomes, then you know what? If, I'm sorry, if those objectives describe the, the, the content of the course, and those are statements of what it is that students learn in the course, then, uh, okay, let's just, let's just not call them objective, let's call them outcomes. So whatever you wanna call them, skills, competencies, but this is what we want our students to do. And actually, when I, when I look at them, the language is very, very, very accurate, very appropriate. At the conclusion of this course, the students should be able to, and then we have read, analyze, evaluate, apply a variety of strategies, develop, analyze, write, integrate. I mean, these are all very, very, very specific skills. So now we have the course content that's given to us right there. It's course outline of record, right? So let's just say this is the law, so to speak. This is, this is what we need to go by. So this is all cool. Now, all we really need to do is assess them. And in order to assess them, we have to teach them, right? So, however, there is one, one more major, major, major hurdle for us to overcome. Because again, we, we, these are objective not, 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 not outcomes and we get, we get in trouble right away when we go back to our, our curriculum uh, committee and say, okay, I would like to uh, have these um, SLOs approved or, or, or you know, whatever the discussion is. Well, these are these are really not 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 uh, outcomes. These are objectives. So so again, 
I, I would like to make sure that 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 we know what it is, what what it means to look at the course co content and translate it into skills and competencies that students are going to be acquiring in the course. Okay. I'm sorry. Any any questions at this point? Everybody's okay. All right then. So considering this discussion, these are very often asked. The, the questions that are often very uh, that are asked very often. How many SLOs do I need? Okay, so the question, how many SLOs I need, comes again from the idea that student learning outcomes are those murky terms that nobody really knows what to do with, that are being imposed by accreditation and other, uh, and, 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 and let's just say um, others, uh, who say that this is, this is something that's worth, worthy, worthy of doing. The, 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 again, the discussion here needs to be that student learning outcomes, once understood as competencies, as part of the, of the course of what we do, what we teach, um, if, 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 if that definition is followed, then the threat of doing something extra and on top of everything else that I'm doing goes away. So again, it's not really the, uh, the fact that faculty are resented, resentful of, of student learning outcomes. It's this misalignment and really misguided discussion that led us believe over the years that student learning outcomes is something that's imposed on us and it's extra activity and it's extra work. That's why all of a sudden we have we have uh, teacher unions, you know, for example, engaged in the discussion. When you think about it, who wouldn't be right? I'm already doing my job. I'm already grading my students. I'm assessing them. I'm, I'm you know, I can tell you what I do over the weekend, grading all those papers. That's my job. And now on top of it, you want me to SLOs? What, what are SLOs? So just, just, just do SLOs and I'll come back in two weeks, check on you. That's the extent of the conversations that, we, that we've been having, right? That, that you know, I, I, I mean, I, I think it's still the case that many of those discussions are still uh, incomplete and, and, and this SLO mandate is, is, is still a wound that hasn't really healed because we, we, we really have more questions still than answers. So again, one of those things that I could probably offer is this, this, this idea of misalignment. That again, if you only look at the course outline of record and you identify the skills and competencies as these are the objects, this is the, these are the things that I'm going to be teaching, and this is what our students are going to be learning, then I'm home free. Then I don't have to worry about everything else. Because again, the question is, if I am not teaching those competencies and skills, then what am I teaching? This, then how often do I need to assess them? That's, and again, another question, because again, obviously if this is something that's added on, then I, I, don't, I don't want to bother with it. Why do I have to assess them? Maybe I can just leave them alone. And the question really is here that, that again, as I was saying earlier, if you ever wanted to teach anything to anyone, you would ask for understanding, right? You would understand for, uh, okay, now, now, okay, I show you how to do this. Now show me that you can do it now. So this is, this is really very simplistic, but that's ultimately uh, the goal of our, of our uh, activities here in the, in, in the classroom. And then when we come to program learning outcomes, it's the same thing. Okay, so I am already, whatever you want me to do with those SLOs, now I have to do program learning outcomes. So it's really the question is not how many or how often to assess them. But the bottom line is, okay, what do you need to know about your student learning to improve? To improve your pedagogy, to improve the way you teach and to improve your institution. So if you think of, of, of program learning outcomes or institutional learning outcomes that way, all of a sudden those discussions about the workload go away because now I am really interested from semester to semester, from year to year, from, from course to course, how my students are doing. So it's not like, you know, for, I, I'm, I'm, I'm being asked those questions about institutional learning outcomes. That's a that's, that's really interesting discussion. So let, let's, let's, this is anecdotal, but, but I'm sure you're, you're, you're familiar with those types of discussions. So our college, our institution, our university identified those six, seven, eight, 12 institutional learning outcomes. Well, obviously six of them is just so much work. What can we do it? So we have agreed an academic Senate stands behind it. We are going to, to, to assess one SLO uh, per year because it's an institution, so it's a huge, huge endeavor. 
Okay, so, so we start with communication. So we, we, we are going to assess how our students are doing on competency institutional learning outcomes. So we are going to collect the data, whatever, whatever it means. And, and after one year, we know this is our, how our students are doing on communication. Then the following year, we are going to, um, let's just say, assess technology. Okay, so how familiar they are with technology. And then you only think, you think to yourself, okay, so if I do it every six years, like why, why isn't that a problem? Think, think for a moment, if you assess the communication in 2021 plus six, so you're going to know, you're going to be discussing the results, what, 227 when you get to it again. And then when you institute, if you were to even start doing some uh, interventions in order to improve it, you're going to wait another six years to see the results. So six plus six is 12. So that means that in 12 years, I'm going to know what I, what I, what, 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 what's happening right now, or, or at least I'm going to have a meaningful discussion about what it is that I'm uh, doing to improve uh, communication among students graduating from my college in 12 years. Okay, so that's communication. Let's just say communication is something that's, that's okay, from the beginning of times, people were able to communicate. But when you think of technology, Okay, go ahead and try to assess the technology or, or student awareness or, or, or instructional practices based on technology in 12 year intervals. I mean, this is, you know, when you think about it 12 years ago, technology looked quite different. And then again, if you were to look at the year 2000, you can't even, you know, 1995. I mean, we, we didn't have internet in 1995, right, to speak of. So things are changing so very quickly that, that really measuring um, effectiveness of our institutions that's that's based on 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 those five four five six year intervals is 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 I suppose problematic. Uh, so uh, go uh, I, I yes Leslie go right ahead please do speak. You're mute. You're muted, Leslie. Uh, Leslie, you're you're muted. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to throw this concept out. I was thinking about this uh, last night about how, um, you know, we, I, I, I agree with everything you're saying. Uh, you're, you're just right on Yannick. And, um, but I'm wondering if we can't even get to the level of allowing students to develop their own individual outcomes, because, you know, everybody comes in with specific skills, talents, and we need to embrace that and allow them to excel. I personally had the opportunity when I was an undergraduate at UC Santa Barbara to develop my own individual major. My grandfather was born on the Choctaw Indian Reservation. And so I was able to develop an individual major that I call pre-Columbian St studies of the new world. So I went across disciplines. I was able to take art, art history, history and uh, Spanish and put that all together and I kind of ignored Europe and the rest of the world and focused on the entire new world. And I was allowed, and they put it in the College of Scholars and I was allowed to design exactly what fit my needs. And then they, they not only accepted it, but they you know, put me in the College of Scholars. That sounds pretty classy, right? And um, so I'm just one, I was thinking, you know, like, you know, I used to teach ESL and uh, non-credit ESL and all of those students came in with some individual goals, not what we establish at an institutional level or the state level to tick off, the boxes to tick off, just as what um, you're talking about. But, but the, the students say, okay, I wanna, you know, right now I'm a, a dishwasher. I'd like to be able to move to busboy where I get tips and then, you know, move on to be a server or, or whatever, or, you know, in all areas, and when I was on the policy board of the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce, and we talked to all the high tech people, all of the high tech companies in San Francisco had their own little ideas of what they were looking for and student skills they were looking for. And, and they were impressed by the students who took individual initiative to search out and excel in their talents. So I just kind of wanted to put that individual characteristic. And I see someone in the chat said student smart goals. Uh, I'm not familiar with that term, uh, Enrique, uh, but I just wanted to put that in the in the discussion. But I think you're just right on what you're doing, and I hope I'm 
with you when I say these things. So that's 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 exactly right. I I, I think that again I, I I mentioned that earlier. This is my my newest thought that that occurred to me as a discussion as a result of the discussion I had with um, a historian from um, uh, Cal State Long Beach, Dr. Nancy Kwam Wickham. You know, she she said that. Uh, again, we don't empower students to the point that they are able to talk about their own learning. There's just no system for that, right? So again, students come in with a problem, there is a course. That's the solution. 16 weeks of your life. And then when you think about it, okay, so I, I've been taking algebra courses all my life for four years in, 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 in high school, you know, and, 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 and I come to college and there it is, there it is again. And my grade in, in algebra has always been, uh, I don't know, let's just say somewhere around the C. So, you know, okay, maybe you don't need to have another algebra course. That def you definitely do. So I go in there and I, 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 I'm, let's just say 70, 80% of the course I'm very much familiar with. I'm just missing those, those, those couple of concepts that, that will be explained to me in week 12 and 13. And that's, you know, for the first 10, 11 weeks of the course, I'm just so bored of my wits that, you know, by the time it gets to, it's okay, you know what, I've heard it so many times, I'm, I'm just kind of like shutting off completely, and I miss the end of the semester, and I'm still getting a C, and, and, and there's just no, no way for us to address this, I mean, there's, uh, it, it, the, the system is just not, not flexible enough for us to, to address that, so, so that's what it is, I think that, you know, at the symposium, uh, Chancellor Lowe st spoke uh, as, as, as the keynote about the importance of placement, and, and we just, um, Again, we just don't pay pay enough attention to it. We we don't have a good system. The the conversation with the counselor really narrows down to to the GPA and course completion. There is no discussion about what it is that students can do or how can we help you. Just imagine if we were to only equip ourselves with 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 tools that would allow us to assess what it is that students know, then all we would have to do is you know why don't you go you know hey there is a tutor you know sit with him for about 15, 20 minutes he's going to explain it to you. And then all of a sudden, the whole algebra concept comes into place. Um, just that they again, maybe that's simple and idealistic, but but it would be really cool if we had those things. So so thank you very much. Any, anyone else who would like to speak? There's some comments. Okay, so everything's okay then. So um, again, I, I I refer you to uh, here to those two documents that have been published back in 2009, I think. Uh, and and, and uh, I'm sure that Academic Senate is very proud of the fact that, that there isn't really anything better that has been published ever since. I know that there's been some update, updates and again, Academic Senate took care of this, but, but I tell you, those are just fantastic documents that, that really uh, help us understand the concept of, of, of SLO quite well. So, so again, I would, I would be happy to, I, I would strongly recommend that, that you um, refer to those. So then there is this issue of grading that, that, I, that I mentioned earlier, right? So first of all, I, 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 I said at the beginning that um, learning in our classrooms is, is, is implied and it could be inferred. So this is something that, that happens, but we really don't have good way to, um, uh, to assess that, to make sure that it's actually um, uh, taking place. So, so the, the example here that I have is that uh, CNA are, first of all, both of them are passing grades, right? And we really, again, don't really know what it is that's, what, what's the difference? I mean, there's this, you know, one student C is going to be different from another student C is going to be different from another student C, the same with A's, right? And then when you think about it, uh, there's, there's always this example that I, that I like to give in trainings is uh, uh, between theory and practice. So let's just say you get a grade of B, like right in between. Uh, it's just that your, 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 your skill or, or your knowledge of the theory of the course is much higher than the practice. And then what happens is you, you, you again, you get a grade of B, you're qualified to go somewhere else, you're moving on to the next level. And that's when you're going to get stuck because all of a sudden your reading skills are not going to be enough because now we are going to be talking, we, we are going to be doing things. It's, it's a, let's just say you hit a course that's, that's really heavy on, on, on lab and, 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 and doing things with your, with your hand and uh, really solving problems on your feet rather than just reading and, and doing research. Uh, so thank you very much, Cheryl, for sharing the, the, the update for the, um, the SLO glossary. That's, I, I, I really appreciate this. So again, there is this uh, fascinating book of, of 
uh, on grading by Susan Bloom. Um, again, if you just Google it, you're going to find it. And the, the next one that I really like a lot I'm reading right now is what you get. And um, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but the, the, that's what students ask, right? They, they never talk or, or, or you know, if, even with professors or anybody, what it is that you've learned, what did you get? That's what, that's what matters, right? So, so the book is uh, actually was the, 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 the original version of the book was published in 1970. And now they, the authors revisited the concept and they really translate it in a, and they put it in the context of 2021 discussions. So the book was really published three weeks ago. It's just really fresh off the press. Fascinating reading. You just got, you, you have the first um, hand account of how people were talking, you know, back in 1970 and what, what it is that they are talking about right now. And the story is exactly the same. Nothing really has changed. So that's, that's, that's very, uh, very telling. So please don't, don't hesitate. Do, do look at, the, at, 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 at both of them. Uh, so now that after grading, we go to the fascinating discussion of the syllabus. And this is where we are going to start talking more about uh, equity and how it, how it really uh, plays out in our classrooms. So again, this is my favorite uh, educator here. Mm. John Dewey has a, has a quote and, and, and ultimately looking at the SLO documents, looking at course outline of record, we are ready to translate everything and put it, put it in the syllabus. So now this is, this is what's happening. And let me see how those, how those links are going to work. So what I have done is I, I did some, some research. Uh, I really pretty much Googled um, English 101 or math, uh, math 100 uh, syllabus in, in online. And this is what I found. This is not really an, an aberration, I don't think. So this is a, a, a first page of uh, English 101 freshman composition. And this is, again, some unsuspecting soul that, that just put his or her syllabus out there and I, and I just grabbed it. So I tried to stay away from the names. I don't mean to be uh, judgmental people, you know, we, we all do what we can. Um, but here, here it is, this is the course description. So English 101, standard course for first year college students, right? We know exactly what, what this is about. The three stages of writing, writing essays in various modes, grammar reading, right? This is what the course is going to cover. So we are okay. Then there's the textbook and then there's the objectives. So English 101 is an introductory writing course. The course will cover, the course will cover all fundamental principles of writing. Grammar exercises will supplement writing instruction to provide you a review of current usage. We'll use essays for two purposes, to generate topics for your writing and to study as models for structure and style and composition. Okay. And then there is the requirement. Five essays, including a final. Completely any, complete any makeup work before finals week. That sounds like a typical syllabus, right? In a sense that it's, it's really a list of, of, of hoops that students have to jump through. And there is, there is page two to it, just, just so that you know that I'm not, you know, like putting it out of context. And again, there is attendance requirements, there's conferences, and then there is the grades. How are you going to be graded? So we have the description or narration, 500 words is required, classification in class, whatever that means, proposal essay, final, everything's assigned certain percentage point, there's the web project, attendance, the total is 100%. And then when you, when you think about it, okay, so I am a student here and, you know, I, I, I was given an essay to turn in and, and um, you know, like everybody else, the essay was due on Thursday at 5 p.m. And I am, I am late by 15 minutes, so, so there we go. Then 15% of my grade is out the window. And um, that's a common practice. The question is, what does this have to do with student learning? Really, when it comes to the content of the course, what is it that students have learned from the exercise? So let's, let's go to page two, 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 to the last, last part of the syllabus discussion here. And there's even more of the same. Late work, attendance, graded material, accommodations for students with disabilities, honor code, emergency notification system. Where is there a statement, I am going to learn X, Y, and Z in this course? So this is again what, what Leslie and others are saying that you know, when, you, when you think of, if, if you 
put this in front of the students, what do you expect? A few years back, um, uh, students, uh, uh, five or six of them came to our academic senate meeting at Santana College. And, uh, and they told us, they did. Before they even register for any courses, they go to ratemyprofessor.com and they look for a person who requires the least amount of work. And then we think that you know our systems are our system is failing the students. But again, this is not it's it's not them. I think it's 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 pretty much when you when you think about it, uh, human nature, right? If 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 there is a system that I need to be compliant with, uh, and uh, you know, sure, there 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 are there are people there are there are students and there are faculty who are deeply engaged and deeply concerned about their learning, but the system really doesn't necessarily call for that. We are we are holding ourselves and our students accountable by issuing grades, not necessarily higher expectations of learning. So um, the the syllabus becomes this this uh, uh, call for accountability, right? And 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 yeah, we we we've seen these T-shirts around. We we certainly have, and this is kind of like you know, okay, uh, when you think about it, how how. How do you think the student feels? Because, you know, I'm I'm kind of like thinking myself of myself again. And there's there's we we hear in academia fairly often this 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 discussion between, you know, academic freedom and and and, and business models, right? That our students are really our customers, so we need to be taking care of them. And I'm thinking like, okay, if if I were to to be serious about that statement, you know. Anywhere I go, as long as I engage, right? So let's just say that I go to Home Depot, I go to a dentist, I go to a car dealer, right? And I need certain things from them and they're going to evaluate me and tell me, okay, Home Depot is going to, no, 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 you're looking for, you know, summer shorts that's gonna be, you know, like across the street or, or the dentist is going to say, sorry, you can't, no, not here, you have to go to a different office or the car dealer, no, you need a different car, whatever. But once I engage them in the discussion, are you kidding? They are very happy to see me. They really are. Nobody tells me, okay, here's the product, go away. I mean, maybe 50, 100 years ago, this was the case, right? I bought a refrigerator, I bought TV, I brought it home, and if it didn't work, oh, well, then that was stuck. It was just bad luck. These days, there is a website, there are instructional videos, there are 800 numbers, and as a matter of fact, on the, on the, on the uh, carton on, with, with, with the refrigerator or a table that I had to put together at home, it says right there, please do not return this back to the store, call our 800 number, we'll help you. And for our students, instead of providing 800 number and this just in time help and assistance, we kind of like mocked their lack of, I don't know, they're just not paying attention. It's on the syllabus, you know, like, like you still didn't get it. So I'm just thinking to myself, okay, Nowhere outside of the of the classroom at the college is there an institution or a person who's going to tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. It's the other way. The question that I get is how can I help you? Okay, so so that's that's perhaps you know our our uh, discussion about about the syllabus. And again, uh, it's it seems like this this issue of really misalignment and misunderstanding and and perhaps certain ways of thinking about education that have been that 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 have been uh, persisting our system for for years uh we just don't seem to move away from them because again when you think about it yeah that's exactly what i was told when i was going to school when i was in my uh going for my ba or master's degree i was always told oh no 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 it's it's already there it's in the syllabus so now when i'm empowered to teach others why would i behave differently uh stacy please i'm sorry Oh, I was, uh, yeah, just reflecting on um, the fact that we're opening up this for discussion is extremely exciting and gives us a lot of room to really humanize education a lot more um, with our students and focus in on what's important. Um, I wanted to actually speak a little bit to the grading piece and component of it because I, I remember being an institutional researcher and getting that question a lot as we were trying to change SLO culture on our campus to be 
learner centered, like why are we even doing it, trying to get it out of that compliance um, orientation framework that people were, you know, there is a lot of history and anxiety and trauma um, from how SLOs were rolled out at a lot of places, but the focus now more on competencies and realizing that we need to get down to that granular level is not only important for the student, right? And what does an A mean to a student? Like, I guess I did well in the course, but it doesn't necessarily tell me what specifically I did well, right? Or if I need to improve on something and continue my learning, I don't have specifics of what that is. Do I need to work on my quantitative reasoning skills? And then how would I do that in the next course? That's completely unclear in an ABC um, kind of framework, right? Um, and then the huge component of this is us as educators what do we focus on in terms of where the gaps are in learning for students? We don't know that until we get to that granular level. Um, and this is coming from an institutional researcher, right? Success uh, rates are important, um, but to dig deeper into what's going on, you need to have additional data, which would be those um, student learning outcomes, focusing on those competencies and the skills that students are, are or are not learning in each of our courses. But just wanted to bring that up. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I, I couldn't agree more, Stacey. Thank you very much for the comment. Absolutely. The importance of that discussion is, 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 is really, really crucial at this point. Uh, as, I, as I wrote on the bottom, the question is, what are we going to study or are we, what are we going to learn? And the syllabus really needs to tell us that. The syllabus really needs to give answer to that question. And Am I going to it, cover right? things? <laughs> And each assignment, in addition to the syllabus, um, it's really rethinking how we're intentional about the whole educational process. So absolutely, if we were to only structure the assignments about what it is around the concepts that students are supposed to be learning, then I think we would have completely different discussions in our classrooms. I mean, again, this would be a completely different uh, conversation with the student, not, not okay, no, buddy, you're you're you know you're you're threatened by a C in this course, so why don't you show up at the my office hours and 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 we'll talk about what it is that you can do to make it better, or or you know I'll I'll give you an extra homework extra assignment you can write an extra paper and just come back next week and and maybe we'll make it a C plus. Uh, instead, let's focus on what it is that that students needs to learn. Okay, so you're still struggling with APA style. Okay, so there is there is you know a few paragraphs and you know there is the citations that you can pr probably work on, you know, and bring it back and we'll we'll, we'll talk about it. So that it's that we create an artifact and students can actually re re can relate to it instead of again having those murky conversations about about things that you know uh, satisfying the the the, the uh, hoops that students have to jump through. So again, moving, moving on, Stacy mentioned this humanizing uh, syllabus. So, so there is this concept of, of, of uh, liquid syllabus, which really uh, calls for um, construction of, of, of perhaps there's, you know, there's going to be, because syllabus is, has, been, has been always considered this very dry, formal, uh, contract-like, you know, almost, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know, um, the, uh, very, very, very dry language, right? So let's make it a little bit more pleasant for students. And um, and I will I will show you what um, uh, this is. You know they they do it. This is this is an extract from uh, USC work. This is uh, University of Southern, Southern California. They they have this uh, Equity Institute where they where they suggest the following. So we have uh, they they identify certain unwelcoming and welcoming. Um, uh, language that 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 may exist versus what what's 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 recommended so uh, again when you when, yes go ahead oh, sorry, sorry. sorry could you actually zoom in a little bit oh, um, i'm sorry it you're right you're right a little far thank away you, thank you, thank you. So here's here's the zoom oh yeah this will work thank you thank you stacy sorry sorry is that better okay thanks so let's let's look at this. So on the right hand side, we have then, uh, at least on my screen, on the right hand side, we have the unwelcoming language, right? And on the left, we have the welcoming one. So let's look at this office hours, nothing's there. Uh, location, then the, the time, and then there is the email. 
And then unwelcoming language is, if you need to contact me outside of office hours, you may email me, call my office or contact the department and leave a message, okay. But the welcoming one is, I welcome you to contact me outside of class and student hours. You may email, call and contact the department and leave a message. Okay, so I'm just trying to think, okay, so the welcoming part is something that's going to do what for me exactly? Do, do I feel like I'm more welcome to, to take this course? Then we have the same thing with, with, with course goals. And, and I'm just trying to understand what is, what is the thinking here? How, how is this more equitable? Because again, what happens here is that um, uh, if, if we are to grab and, and, and really welcome students and make sure that they come to our classes, um, and the syllabus, again, is, is still the same, then is this language enough? I mean, what, what is the change that we are trying to make happen here? So let's look at the course goals, right? Some of the specific skills you should obtain in this course are listed below, okay? Then because you're not a critical cons consumer of information, about mental processes and behaviors, all of these activities will help you become one. And if you're motivated, if you're motivated enough, use the skills in your daily life. Okay, cool. So I can agree, this is not necessarily very welcoming. But then on the other side of the spectrum, some of the specific skills I hope you will obtain in this course are listed below. That's no difference there. Being a critical consumer of information about mental processes and behavior is important. All of these activities will help you become one. And it is my hope that you will use the skills in your daily life. So again, course goals. It's the teacher's hope that we are going to use certain skills in daily life. Attendance, class participation, just like in any good old fashioned syllabus, right? So it just kind of like, you know, when I re read this, it just made me think. So, Again, there is, there is no focus on, 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 on competency attainment. There is, there is no difference whatsoever. We just, instead of come to my office hours, we are going to write, please come to my office hours. Uh, so when you think about it, okay, maybe, maybe there is something to be said about, like I said with this, you know, it's on the syllabus t-shirt. Maybe there is something to be said about being polite to students. Okay, that, that's a discussion that, you know, perhaps we could have, fine. But when it comes to, again, what it is that students learn or, or what it is that you're, they are going to get out of the, um, out of the course, this, this, that, that is just, just, just not addressed. So again, we are trying to be more polite, more engaging. Uh, we are going to use videos and we are going to use, uh, I don't know what else, the, the power of technology to kind of like grab student attention and, and, and uh, on, on, on the surface, uh, engage them. Because when I, when I think about it, there is, there is you know, again, you're, you're welcome to look them up and, and there is liquid syllabus all over the place. And faculty are, are there recording their voices, recording their faces, and they speak of their family life and, and uh, what, what, what they do and how long they've been teaching and all this. And, you know, with best of intentions, obviously. It's just that the question is, okay, so, so now I know more at the, at the personal level about the faculty who is going to be teaching me, again, the question is, okay, you know what? I, I really need to know if you're going to require five homeworks or only three, that's, that's really my question. So, so again, those discussions, again, uh, they, they, are, they are with best of intentions, but again, the question is, is, is this really enough to bring our students and, and uh, to, to, to our courses? So there is a bit of a hope. There is, there is again, when you, when you do some, some deeper research, uh, you're going to see, for example, a syllabus that, that looks like this. So we have course description, and then there is overall course objectives. Upon completion of this course, students will be able to employ a generative and recursive writing process, work collaboratively, write whole essays, think critically, write essays, very sentence structure. And all of a sudden, my attention is like, whoa, look, I'm going to be doing these things consciously or not. This is what I'm thinking as a, as a reader of this document. I'm sorry, I, um, please, um, uh, Celeste, do, do speak. I'm sure you're going to articulate it better than just me reading what you just wrote, if you don't mind. Sure, can you guys Yes, hear thank me? you. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, 
So for me, I guess my course is a little different because I teach career and life planning. So my course is specifically designed to help students figure out what their major is, what their career path is. Because I work in academic counseling and we get a lot of students who start college and they really don't know why or, or why, you know, what major to choose, et cetera. So for my class, I, you know, over the years, I've designed different assignments that really help them understand why. You know, why am I having you do, go to this website and do this personality assessment? Why are we using this? Um, I think it's not bad to be really clear with the students. I think they like it. They don't want to be guessing and being tricked. And, you know, so I use clear grading criteria. I don't know who else uses Canvas, but um, I like Canvas and I use the, the grading criteria like rubrics for each assignment and we go over them and I explain explicitly why what I'm talking about ties to that assignment, what they're gonna get out of it, what I want them to get out of it. And I think um, at least in the semester system at a community college, I think faculty can get lost in 18 weeks. Like, okay, I know they need to learn this, this and that, but I, I think the slows in my class are, they're good ones, but I have taught courses before where I had like five slows and, and it's just, it's too much. And I think three is a good uh, sweet spot for student learning outcomes, but they have to be, yeah, they have to be, um, I don't know how to say it. I guess they really need to be what the students need to learn in that class. So okay. for me, it's, it's helping them figure out what is your major, what is your unique personality values, interest skills, and how to channel that into a career it actually fits your personality or what skills are you lacking that you can develop um, to go into your desired career or what are your values and what kind of personality you have that you know would really uh, make you unique and special in that job so for me I guess I have a, a different lens that's actually one of my favorite classes to teach but I could see how this information would really it would you know it's kind of harder when you're teaching maybe a hard science or a technical more technical type of class. But in my comment, I was just saying that, you know, instead of having the students do a quiz or exam, I have set questions in my grading criteria and then I'll have them submit a video response. Mm. Especially because of COVID, we're online, you know, the, <laughs> the, the right. people part is taken out of it. But if they submit a video um, with answering those set questions, it's like they answered the quiz in a short answer statement, but it's, you know, through their voice. Right. And they also do Google Slides and PowerPoints. And they're like, according to Bloom's taxonomy, they're creating a PowerPoint. They're creating Google Slides. It's not just, oh, give me the information back, give me the knowledge back that I just gave you, but they're creating something new. And so we go over Bloom's taxonomy and That's right. higher order thinking. So, I mean, I think we just need to get creative with it too. So, I don't know. There's just a lot. This is a really good topic. I don't think slows are the devil. You know, I don't think they're bad, but I do think that we do get lost along the way. Right. So like, we get right, lost right. along the way. Outcomes. Yeah. Of course. So, so again, I think what I what I could point out here is that you're 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 again underlying the importance for students to articulate what it is that they learn, because every time they create a PowerPoint, every time they answer a question, that's that that really makes them produce something for you that creates a document that really validates what it is that they do. I think that's, that's that you're, you're absolutely right. I think that's, that's the part that's really missing. We are, we are more, uh, again, uh, focused on, on, you know, jump through that hoop and, and, you know, make sure that you show up for the next two office hours or something like this, you know, or, or turn in an assignment and everything will be fine. But instead, you are actually asking them to, to, to do something. And you're right. That's, 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 that's the point that's, that's always, uh, you know, for all, all those kind of all, all those reasons that 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 we we've been talking about um, is, is 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 often missing. So that's that. And I I think I'm I'm not sure. It, does anyone? I, I think I don't know if it's Carrie or. And again, I apologize. It's really difficult for me to manage the the chat room. Uh, Carrie, could you please uh, speak a little bit? I think you you made some comments in the in the chat room here. Yeah, 
It just feels like a lot of the things that I was hearing don't apply well to STEM classes. Like there, when someone takes a Gen Chem class, there's some things that they're expected to know. I can't just say, choose your own adventure, right? Like it, there really are some specific things and, and definitely like students should figure out what they're good at and et cetera. But there's also an expectation that they have this base set of skills because they earned a chemistry degree. Right. So, when they get to which track they choose or whose research lab they choose to work in or what project they do in their in their course based undergraduate research experience or something like that you can provide the flexibility in a few places but a lot of like the fundamental stem courses need to teach what they teach and there isn't flexibility there and so one of the things I've been working on this year with someone, and I actually wanted to come to this meeting when I saw it, because we're actually going to be writing our SLO quizzes today. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll learn something more about SLOs. Um, is I've been working with someone else to rewrite our SLOs for our chemistry classes because um, we felt that they weren't clear to the students. Like, what are they trying to get out of that? And so someone asked me to put them in the chat, and so I did. <laughs> so it was like a big word vomit there. Huh. Okay, you know what? That's that's perfect segue. That's that's really you know uh, that's that's the next next uh, uh, next next slide. So you're you're right 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 there. Um, I'll I'll be happy to entertain the discussion. Uh, so so there is again quote from John Dewey. There is a difference in the world between having something to say and having to say something. Right. So that's that I think is what what's what's addressing your comments. That again, it it has to happen. Okay, it has to happen for a reason. Students are just like us, human beings. You know, we like to have reasons for what we do. We really do. As a matter of fact, you know, yeah, ask anyone. You gotta do it because you gotta do it. What, 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 what reaction do you expect to get? Oh, because I say so, you have to do it. Really, that's an argument? So just if, if, if you were to, yeah, follow, follow what John do and again, I, I, I I would I would really strongly recommend that that we open John Dewey and start start reading his things that he wrote over 100 years ago. It's just very very enlightening, and again, it's it's really it just makes you think. Why all of a sudden we think that we are higher level of of of, of human beings that are going to be demanding of our other human beings that they jump through the hoops that we design for them. And again. I, I don't experience it anywhere else in, in, in the world. And, and even if I have to do dishes in my kitchen because my wife says I have to do it, well, at least I know why. <laughs> I just don't know what would be a good, good analogy here to, to um, justify what it is that we do with students when we ask them to do things for, without really putting them in the context. I, I think that's my point, okay? So uh, let's let's move on to Bloom, Bloom's taxonomy, and this is you know I, I hope I'm going to address those those questions about understanding of uh, uh, demonstrate an understanding. So Bloom's taxonomy, and again you can you can read about Bloom's work because that's um, uh, quite an extensive piece of literature. It is as it is, it is and, and and the taxonomy that he developed with others is, is just one of the aspects of his work, but he's, he's by himself a fascinating figure. Uh, so, but, but we do have the um, uh, Bloom's taxonomy. And again, when you, when you look from the very bottom, uh, we have those uh, fact recollection of basic concepts, right? If I were to ask you what your phone number is or what is three times seven, you're going to tell me right away. But what we really need to go for is through understanding application analysis evaluation, we go to a creation aspect. And to be honest, in our current system, uh, personally, honestly, personally, it didn't hit me until I started working on my dissertation. At that time, I was told specifically, you know what, you're not here to change the world. You have to figure out a unique piece of knowledge, something that nobody has ever thought before. And it was just such a revelation that I, I just, I just, I couldn't sleep at night. I just couldn't understand. Like after all these years of being told that you have to, you have a test on Thursday night, all of a sudden there is this 
weight of responsibility on me to develop something new. And as a matter of fact, again, if we were to think about this and apply it in our classrooms, our lives would be completely different. Just think about it, if you were to, and again, this is from my ESL background. I, I, I've been teaching ESL pretty much all my, all my life. Uh, there are the conditional clauses, right? So just imagine if you were George Washington running for a president into 2020, what would you do? And it's kind of like, you know, okay, hold on a second. So now I have to understand who George Washington was. What was his political reality? versus what it is that's happening right now, and then put all this information and let it sift through my mind because this is me, what I would do. It's just when you think about it, that's just just, just amazing discussion that you may have. And really the question is about, again, attainment of skill, right? The discussion between objective and, 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 and outcome. What's the difference between federal and state governments? Okay, is that an objective or an outcome? So again, at, in continuing ed, that's probably a, you know, an hour conversation in a citizenship course, right? When we prepare students to take citizenship tests. Okay, so they know that there is the state government and then they know that there is the federal government. And then they have those separate powers. Each one is, is, is uh, in charge of, of its own jurisdiction. But then when you, when you think about it, Probably the, the, uh, the differences between the two powers are probably subjects of dissertations that are being written as we speak at the highest levels of political science courses at UCLA and other, other universities, right? So, so it, it really, go, going back to the discussion, and, and I'm sorry, I just, I just recalled that, that we, we, we talked about the difference between objectives and, and, and outcomes. Don't, don't let anybody tell you that this is an out outcome and this is an objective because I say so. It really depends on, on, on the way you're looking at it. And again, look at the course content. So when it comes to Bloom's taxonomy, is that the value behind the taxonomy, the, the, the ranking here of, of, of uh, uh, tasks that grow in, in, in cognitive uh, uh, complexity from, from the most basic ones to the most uh, complex ones, is that we can observe them. So again, someone asked in the chat there, how am I going to assess demonstration of understanding? Okay, very good question. That's being asked all the time. You know what? You can't. You can't. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at your faces here and many of you have, have cameras on and only because you smile and you nod and you're nice to me, I really cannot tell if any of this that I'm talking about is getting to you. So if I were to ask you, do you understand everything? And, every, and everybody nods their heads. I'm like, oh yeah, I mean, I'm on the roll. I mean, everybody's getting it, right? I mean, I don't know about those people who have cameras off because they don't say anything at all. So I'm kind of like stuck in this, in this you know, Zoom reality, right? And I'm just asking like, okay, so how am I going to ensure that, that you're learning? Well, guess what? I have to ask you to produce something. And unless you do, there's nothing I can do. So demonstration of understanding is a concept or, or is a phrase that is really not only difficult to um, explain, but it's very, it's, it's, it's impossible to assess. So instead, let's go ahead and, and look at the Bloom's taxonomy verbs and how, and the question that I would ask myself is how am I going to ask my students so that they, so that I know and they know that they are demonstrating the understanding of the topic that we are talking about. So that's perhaps the question to address Carrie's concern about chemistry lab, you know, and how do I develop uh, SLOs there? Well, let's look. Define starting from the bottoms things that students remember, right? Define, duplicate, list, memorize, repeat. Okay, that's probably in chemistry quite applicable. As a matter of fact, it's applicable in any course. Right? We, we want our students to remember certain facts. Then we move up the, up, 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 up the scale, up the scale, up the scale. We go through apply, analyze, evaluate, and then again, create. So if you were, if you were to think of what it is that students can create in your courses as a result of your instructional activities, then that ultimately is going to lend itself to an assessment. 
because you can observe a, an act of creation. You certainly can. And then what, what you have is, you know, you have the assessment rubric that's going to specifically identify the skills that students need to demonstrate. And then it, 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 a good practice here is that uh, when you think about it, if uh, let's just say at the end of the semester, whenever you get to it, right, you have, you have the uh, students present their work. And again, it's not for them to get a grade, but for them to demonstrate what it is that they've learned, right? So you're going to have students on the stage one by one, demonstrating what they've learned. And then each person in the classroom has access to the rubric. Just imagine a practice like this, right? So all students who are sitting in the classroom assess every single person that steps up to the podium or shows up on the screen. And then they go through the rubric and there is five, six, seven, 10, 12 criteria that students demonstrate. So all of your students will go through that and assess their peer 30 times if you have 31 students in class. So just imagine if you had to repeat a lecture 30 times, you just wouldn't do it, right? But students get to listen and watch same concept over and over and over again. I mean, if you're big on repetition, that's just, you know, perfect um, instructional stra strategy to, to, for that. Stacy, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to um, chime in. Um, I've been checking the chat. There's been a really robust discussion around um, kind of students, um, you know, kind of help like choosing and selecting their own learning journeys versus the need to balance um, that out with uh, like things that need to be standardized, right? As, as learning objectives, um, because they're required by industry, they're required as like prerequisites for other courses and those things. Um, so yeah, just wanted to kind of bring attention to that. And I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive, right? If you're you don't have to go full into one at the exclusion of the other. I think there, um, I was reflecting on some of what was being said and thinking about, okay, it's like, yes, we have things that we need students to actually pass and learn and be able to, to do, but I think we're really rethinking about how we're also curating that learning journey for students, right? So even if there are set destination points of what students need to do, you know, we're getting away from more of like rote memorization versus like applied learning, project learning, right? Authentic assessment of, of more complex tasks that are higher up on the Bloom's taxonomy, because that also indi indicates deeper levels of learning as well. So, um, you know, in terms of um, some of these things that are going on, like I, I see all the sides and I'm, I'm excited because I don't think they're necessarily at opposition with one another. So um, just wanted to, to bring that to the attention of, Thank of you. Uh, this discussion. Yes, of course. Thank you very much, Stacey. I, I think that, that uh, that's true, that those comments are not necessarily mutually exclusive. But the bottom line is that, again, our system is such that students move through their pathways as a result of course completion. And, and we really don't have a good way, to, good system to, to make sure that they are learning in the process. Leslie, please. Exactly. Sorry. You're, you're muted. Uh, yep, yep. Okay, Jerry, first, I loved where you were going. So I really, in a way, didn't want to interrupt you because I think you're 100% on a track. So please don't come back to where you were going. And I okay. want to echo what Stacy said, but I want to kind of apply an example to, um, I'm not sure it's exactly STEM, it's economics, which is the uh, a, a, a potentially a barrier to entry to business, which is possibly the most, um, I think it's the uh, most common, uh, most popular uh, major. And economics, of course, involves lots of mathematics. And many times there's gatekeepers to get into those econ one and econ two. So I just wanted to cite a city college of San Francisco. I consider brilliance by the economic um, teachers there. They created a course called the economy of the African-American community or something close to that. And we did a study, how did we get African-Americans into the basic courses, econ one and two, micro and macro. The fact of the matter was they took the advanced course first. In other words, we had to show them that what was their interest? Why should they waste their time in micro and macro that they don't even understand those terms? I mean, what, 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 why, you know, I'm, you know, why would I be doing that? But when we taught them the economics of the African-American community, which in most courses places would be considered a junior level class, right? An upper division class. But we taught it and that was the entry point. 
we got them interested. Then they found out the relevancy and then they enrolled. And so we tracked it. That's how we got 70 to 80% of the African-American students, especially the African-American males into the Econ 1 and the Econ 2 class and opened up the door to one of the most important issues to economic justice. So I just, I really, I'm not, not saying we don't need core competencies. I am suggesting that there needs to be uh, the ability to individualize the pathway, individualize the choices, make it relevant, and sometimes upside down, meaning more heavily uh, focused subject matter before the basic skills. The same is true for math and many other courses where students are, okay, I'll, I'll I demanded at UC Santa Barbara to finish my English requirements in Spanish. I understand that makes no sense in some aspects. I was sick to tired of English literature and wanted to bring read something else. I don't know. Everybody has their, their interests and we need to um, encourage that. That's all. I just, you know, so anyway. Okay, thanks. Absolutely. So <laughs> Super, thank you. Thank you so much. That's 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 what it is. Again, the system. It needs to be more uh, reflective of what it is that students learn. That's that's what the whole discussion is about, right? That students are moving because they attain certain skills and competencies rather than just co co complete courses. That's 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 very true. Anybody else who'd like to speak at this point? Thank you very much, Leslie, for the comments. Really appreciate this. So let's let's go ahead and move move on to assessment. Uh, so, so when when we talk about the uh, the assessment, is is um, oh gosh, Whew. so we we have we know what where, where SLOs come from, right? There's the course outline of record. We have identified those competencies that students are going to be attaining. We have developed uh, them using uh, Bloom's taxonomy taxonomy verbs so that we know what to expect, what to observe, and then there is the time for assessment. Uh, so it says, as, as, as we talked about grading earlier, um, grading is not necessarily the best system that's reflective of what it is that students learn. When it comes to the, the difference between formative and summative assessment, the formative type of assessment is the one that happens throughout the semester, right? And summative is, happens sort of like summing things up at the end of the semester. And the problem here is that, that, that especially when it comes to, to, to uh, practices with, with uh, uh, equity in mind, the uh, formative assessment is much more conducive to really uh, a system that would be reflective of what it is that students learn as they go along, rather than having this gotcha moment, you know, oh, on the 15th, uh -huh, you, you were supposed to come prepared and you're certainly not. So uh, here goes uh, the part, part of your grade. And as a matter of fact, the uh, formative assessment really does away when you think about it. And again, I, I don't have time to indulge in this. I just realized it's 11.45. But uh, when it comes to the concept of standardized testing, right? That standardized testing is, is this, again, when you, when you look at Bloom's taxonomy, not that standardized tests cannot engage you at higher levels, but they are really very limited when, when it comes to assessment of what it is that students can do. Students recollect knowledge very well when they take standardized tests, right? But, but there isn't really that much of, uh, of, 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 of doing, for lack of a better expression. So again, if, if I were to address Carrie's question about chemistry, sure, maybe that's that's a good way of assessing this. But again, this is this is somewhat uh, me me mechanical and, and, and fairly uh, uh, rudimentary, for lack of a better expression, way to assess of what it is that students can do. So if we were to assign students certain assignments or, or, or certain things that students have to do throughout the semester, and let's just say on a regular basis, uh, then they, 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 they would be more likely to demonstrate what it is that they have actually learned as the semester goes along. And that's, that's another very, very important consideration here that we extensively, especially now with, the, with, with, with Zoom being sort of the law of the land, we have extensive discussions about students cheating, right? That students don't turn on their cameras and they are doing something else and they are, oh, I'm sure they are checking out the answers when I'm, when I'm giving them a test. So again, if, if, if this were to be uh, focused on, on, on doing rather than recollection of specific uh, concepts, then we would do away with, 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 with many of those discussions. Um, so then um, after we have assessed, uh, assessed the student learning, then there is the intervention implementation. So now we are all of a sudden having discussions about, okay, 
So students haven't learned this very well. Why don't I come up with a uh, way to um, to intervene and, and and mitigate their learning so that next time around they are they are successful. And just like Leslie was saying, and, and, and someone before as well, that we this this system would be much more individualized, right? That we would be actually paying attention to specific skills that specific individual students uh, need to develop rather than uh, throwing everything at everyone, hoping for the best, keeping our fingers crossed. So then the, the assessment, and again, in our accountability world, leads to uh, specific uh, data that is going to tell us, okay, on the basis of this assessment, I know that I need um, a computer lab or I need a TA, I need a computer program, I need uh, uh, access to, to a specific textbook or maybe an online module that's going to cost money. And those, those interventions that I envision, because again, I am the faculty of record, right? It's my job to determine what it is that my students need to learn better. I'm going to be requesting the specific re resources. But again, those resources are not to be, to be requested because I, I've been doing it for the last 20 years and I know what's good for them. It's really looking at what it is that students learn. And as a result, having a conversation with, with administration and with the system, okay, so which funding source is going to be satisfying this, this, this request? And again, based on what it is that they learn rather than they, what they have completed, right? Well, what is there cannot do? So there is the, uh, if, you were, if you like to uh, take a look, there is the Niloa um, uh, documenting learning document, uh, comprehensive learner record. And, and they, they published a couple of those. So again, please uh, do Google them. Uh, and there is, there is this um, a website that I, that I think, you know, that it's, it, it may be challenging. I, I don't wanna be, uh, you know, but since I started talking about it, I may as well say it. There is, uh, is, is assessment destroying liberal arts. That's one of the essays that, that really is stressing the issue of, of, of uh, assessment and how it's really uh, destroying education. Um, so uh, please do, do look up. There is, there is a website called uh, bedassessment.org. And, and it really, it's a, it's a blog that's run by, by um, two or three professors and they're uh, contributing authors. And, and, and they, they, they think that they are spelling it out, how, how it is, how, how assessment is bad for education. Again, the, the, what's, what's missing, I guess, from, 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 from their conversation is the assumption or, or what's, what's really present, what's guiding their, their um, conversation is the assumption that um, faculty are resentful to assessment. So again, it's not, it's not the fact that the, the discussion is uh, uh, misguided, it's the fact that, that uh, faculty uh, will not assess and they are just only being told to do it and, 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 and therefore we have to have the discussion that's counter, counter that. So please, again, don't, don't hesitate, look them up and, 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 and read you. you. We all need to educate ourselves as to what it is that's going on and we do need to know how to intelligently respond to, to all those arguments. Uh, anybody else? I'm sorry, Carrie, I think you have some comments again. I, I'm, I'm just kind of like, you know, keeping my eye on the chat. Would you like to speak to those? Now you're okay already then. Thank you, thank you so much. So then we have, you know, when we when we think of of, of, of how we can support each other, uh, there it is. Um, teaching and teaching and learning uh, uh, support groups. Uh, okay, so what I what I've done is I I I, I tried to considering that that you know again all all roads are leading us to pedagogy, how how we teach and what it is that we expect of our students. I I looked up all those all those. Uh, uh, Ivy League universities and even, even Cal State in our system or other universities, they all seem to have some kind of a, a teaching and learning um, institute or teaching and learning office uh, that, that helps faculty with, with uh, de deliver the, the instruction. And for us in, in community colleges, it's, it's more like, oh yeah, we, we can't really talk about this because that's uh, we, we should not be telling faculty what to do, how to teach, and, 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 and what to teach. Uh, so uh, those big universities don't shy away from the discussion. And, and if you were to look them up, uh, they, are, they are there. And uh, at some point, it's again, it's a long discussion that I don't, don't want to indulge in at this point. But I, I, I looked up the, um, uh, what was it, uh, Harvard University Business School. 
you know, and, and uh, talking about high expectations of what it is that our students can do. You know, sure, that's a top ranking university, but I think there is something that we can learn about the respect that they have for students that they, that they receive. So uh, as, as a welcoming ceremony, there is, there's those speeches that, you know, professors and administrators at Harvard share and they, they talk to, to, to the incoming students. But I tell you, they, they use language like, you know, with their resources and they are speaking to students, right? So with the resources that you have, you can pretty much do anything. And the, the, the statement like the, the world is hungry for your leadership. I mean, when you, when you think about it, that's really taking ownership of what it is that the students are, are expected to do in the classrooms. So again, it just kind of like puts, puts this discussion about pedagogy and, and what's happening in the classroom as a focal point of our, of our uh, interactions and activities, rather than just accountability. And, you know, last year we assessed 1,500 SLOs. This year we assessed 1,700 of them. We are going to call it a success. So I hope you, saw, you, 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 you see the difference. And there's the concept of faculty learning communities that, again, was we, we, we talked quite a bit about this at the, at the SLO symposium. So if you, if you have any questions about this, uh, please don't, don't, don't hesitate to let me know. Um, the next part is what, what our um, system, our, our chancellor's office, in collaboration with ACCGC and Academic Senate, are advocating is, this, is the competency-based education. So as far as I can tell, this really is the answer to pretty much uh, everything and anything that we do in the system that's, that's, that's not working. Because all of a sudden, we are going to start paying attention to, to what it is that, that students can do. And I, I do have uh, three videos here. But again, I, I will make sure, since a lot of people ask about this, that the PowerPoint is going to be available right away. And, and then the recording of this is going to be available uh, shortly after. I just have to. You know, perhaps edit the beginning or whatever. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just go through it and uh, make sure that 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 everyone who is not here who would like to refer to it later will will get will 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 get the recording as well. Uh, but the bottom line is that the focus on mastery learning seems to be a concept that is going to address a lot of questions that we have about student learning right now. So again, instead of stressing course completion, we are going to stress. Okay, you have to know this. And you, you, you kind of like, you know, look again at everything that we do, right? When I, when I develop a, uh, an extensive uh, visualization using Tableau, you know, I, I can certainly do it and it's going to take me three or four months and then I publish it somewhere and it looks beautiful. And then three, four, five months later, without having to revisit those skills, I'm just very likely to simply forget. I have, I, I mean, I, it, it happened to me more than once. You know, there, there were things that I created and I went back a few months later and I said, okay, I couldn't have possibly do it. I have no clue how I got there. So again, I, I don't think that my, my learning experience is an aberration. That's probably what's happening with our students as well. So that's probably why, again, when we stress the grade as the only criteria for student success, what happens is that the minute students leave, they, they simply forget what, they, what they've learned. We really, again, don't create the platform. We don't have the, the structure where we could address what it is that students learn. Uh, then finally, there is the skills and, and, and equity. And, and here's the discussion that I, that I think is going to kind of like put an end to this because it's almost 12 o'clock. But um, there is an organization that just kind of like came on my radar very, very recently. It's Open Skills Network. And please uh, uh, take um, uh, take take a note of this, and, and you can look up uh, look at their website. It's just openskillsnetwork.org. Uh, and what they do is that they try to put together uh, tens of thousands of skills into a database that's going to be um, free for the taking. So hopefully, as a result of, of 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 their work, we are going to even move away from from uh, those endless discussions that we have about how SLOs should be phrased. There's going to be certain uh, themes, I imagine, and patterns that will emerge as a, as a result of, of, of many colleges uh, voicing their opinion as to what it is that students need to know in specific courses, right? So, um, 
you can you so so uh, again as, as an institution as faculty member as, as a program you will be able to uh, go to the database grab the skills that students need to know in your in in your course then make sure that they are assessed and 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 off you go on the merry way with 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 making sure that students are learning specific skills and competencies uh so that's that's where we are and i think that um i do have one slide about the equitable pedagogy and again, that's that's the concept that again we uh, again for for our purposes the equity discussion ends with the data that we have right. So we uh, at, at many of our colleges we have again those visualizations with students who are completing certain courses and they are getting certain GPAs and they uh, they progress and they graduate and and then we have uh, research offices who are who are producing this data and then we have meetings during which we interpret this data. And we have those brilliant thoughts about why it is that students are not graduating or they are not completing courses or why their GPAs are so low. And you know what? None of those arguments are have ever anything to do with learning. And that I think is, 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 is of bigger concern than, than anything else when it comes to equity. Because again, when you think about it in the classroom, once you get your students, and again, it's not that faculty don't do it. It's just that we just don't, recognize it as such if you were to go and ask faculty on your campus what does equity mean to you are you kidding faculty actually talk about it they do they do they do care about their students they do care what students learn we just again we are expected to issue a grade and i think that's that's where the discussion is is a little bit um it's 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 just lost the the uh, students uh, students don't know what it is that they learn and faculty don't know the, what, 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 what they teach. And if they do, again, it's not expressed in this equitable language. It's more like, you know, yeah, success rates for, for certain groups of students. So issues of, or, or, or concepts of active learning, case study, assignments, learning by doing. Again, if you were to go to MIT teaching and learning uh, website or, or try even you know Cal State Long Beach for that matter you know they 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 do they do have uh, a lot of information about how to engage students around uh, uh, pedagogies that, that 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 really engage students in meaningful learning practices so that's that's that when it comes to uh, uh, what to do next uh, please if I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's an advice, but this is this is what I do. I, I, I do read a lot. I, I, I tell you, every time I, I attend one of the uh, webinars, I follow up with the with the speakers. I find out what it is that they have to say, and then I buy their book or I read their article, and it just helps me grow. Do connect. So again, it's uh, we 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 do have our uh, SLO symposium listserv, or or again, if you if you. Uh, uh, feel like it or you, you need more information, don't hesitate. You know, people for the most part are really receptive. I, I Sure, there are some who never respond to my emails, but for the most part, when I have a question, there are people who will respond to, 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 to my request eventually. So for that reason, we have now for all those Friday talks that are going to be uh, probably going for the rest of, uh, of the semesters with the end of May, maybe first week of June, I, I have pretty much uh, booked up all, all, all speakers. So it's not going to be uh, me talking every once a week. There is going to be a lot of a lot of people with with really fascinating insights. So again, when it comes to connection, don't hesitate to send emails and ask for help. The discussion is just of paramount importance. So again, if this if those Friday SLO talks are not uh, are, are not enough, then don't hesitate to reach to others and and really talk across campuses, across institutions, and figure out what it is that you need to know. Again, your life and your students' lives are at stake. Do the research. Again, Google is your friend, literally, and there is YouTube, you know, so there is just so much out there and ask questions. So uh, that's probably the most, the most important. Uh, uh, these, are, these are sort of my, my guiding principles for my own professional growth. And that's what uh, uh drives me and 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 uh, gives me confidence that i can that i can speak to you